I'm joined by Nick Merrill, uh, who is the founder and executive director of Calyx, uh, which uh, we're an educational organization that tries to help people uh, regain sovereignty over their data on the internet and in telecommunications. In other words, he helps people uh, stay protected from the bad guys, whether that be NSA or a foreign government or your, you know, whoever's trying to spy on you doing whatever. Um, and so, and, and Jake actually, Jacob Applebaum is, um, he just sent me a, a message. He's somewhere in East Africa without reception. So he's not gonna be able to join us today, but he's fabulous and we'll be talking about Tor at some point, which is uh, a product that he works on in software. Um, today, um, we hope to discuss basically the political structures that underline the, what, what, what we know as the modern surveillance state and what that means in terms of the government's ability to surveil you, um, what that means in terms of law enforcement trends, um, and what that means in terms of uh, analytics and, and, and automation and predictive analytics and, and uh, what I like to call machine-generated culpability, if that makes any sense. Um, if not, hopefully it will at some point. Um, and we're also going to talk about what that means for movement lawyers, since y'all are radical lawyers uh, to the root, right, Bill? And so, and so <laughs> you're on the front lines, and so you can bet that you are being surveilled, or you will be surveilled once you start doing your awesome cases um, or advocacy work. Um, because, you know, so in, in order to explain that, I have to look up what movement was. And actually, a movement is a group of people working together, which is very simple, but that sounds like a conspiracy, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> all I do is look at indictments, so everything I see is written in that way. Um, and so then we'll move on to the, the sort of technical part of the workshop, which is describing what anonymity is, what encryption is, and how to use a very simple tool called Tails. All right, cool. Has anyone copied it down yet? Cool. Oh, and, and by the way, if, if feel free to just interrupt me in the middle of something and say, wait a sec, that doesn't make any sense. So basically, um, in order to understand the playing field of what we're working with here, we have to understand the landscape of modern international conflict, believe it or not, and basically how that results in the blurring of law enforcement and uh, um, intelligence. Um, so over the past 12 years or so, international conflict has been reshaped. State conflicts are increasingly fought within states with non-state actors, in other words, an alleged terrorist is not a state, it's a person. Um, and, and the conflict zone is no longer geographically bound. So the distinction between a civilian and combatant does, does not any longer exist, at least in the eyes of the government. Um, and advances in technology, specifically since the first Gulf War, but more so after 9-11 with the emergence of unarmed drones and the capability of acquiring, mining, managing data, have enabled active defense operations. And an active defense operation basically anticipates a threat and then goes out and gets it. And that's what a signature strike might be, for instance, uh, for a drone strike. And so the use of these preemptive strikes to neutralize threats have essentially changed our conception of, of international law, of self-defense. Um, but also they, they, they require a great deal of intelligence. Uh, what, you know, signals intelligence specifically. Towards the right, that's the United States up top. And towards the left, that's extraterritorial stuff um, outside of the United States. You'll notice that uh, the error up there says that we have limited, US citizens have limited Fourth Amendment rights over there. And over here, these are the authorities that govern um, essentially our privacy. Um, and this up here is the internet backbone. So essentially, as people around the globe chat and browse the internet and talk on the phone using voice over IP and other sort of digitized communications, almost all of that information flows through this internet backbone. And 80% and of that backbone goes through um, US territory. And the other 20% is extraterritorial, but really it goes through um, or is controlled by Vodafone, which is a UK company, go figure. Um, and so we have developed these sort of mechanisms uh, and different technologies that can uh, intercept all the data. So for instance, over here, the red on the right, 
it's just straight collection from the fiber optic cables. All the way on the left is the same thing. But because those packets, our communications, um, are, take route, strange routes to get from point A to point B, so in other words, this sentence I'm speaking to you, every word might take a different route in order to get to you. And if Nick is also talking to you or talking to someone else, those will get jumbled together. And so the rationale then is that we need to collect everything, <laughs> if that makes any sense. And again, the whole justification from the intelligence angle, by the way, if there's a question, feel free to stop me, because. You just faded off, actually. Oh, sorry, I do tend to mumble, that's right. Okay, so, and the whole rationale, again, is to feed this, this portion over here called actionable intelligence. And that then is stored somewhere between a, a week and a month, depending on the type of information that's being stored. We'll, ex we'll explain why in a second. So basically, you get this crazy amount of data. All of this is jumbled out here and all the way to the left. Um, this over here comes directly from our ISPs in the United States, like a Google or a Yahoo, et cetera. And what is called metadata also comes from those, essentially what time you made a call, how long the call was, where you were standing, et cetera. Excuse me? Yes. An ISP? An ISP is an internet service provider. So like a Google or a Yahoo. Um, and over here, there's also our telephone service providers, which have a different mechanism for uh, obtaining that information. Um, so advances in computing technology enable this sort of automated collection and processing of great amounts and different types of information. And in order to actually be able to churn through all that information. If you think about it, it's like the largest document review ever, instantaneously, all the time, all the time, all the time. You have to draw all these patterns, and Nick will describe how these patterns might be drawn and graphing and all this other stuff. Um, but um, they basically developed these automated processes to, to take care of that. And um, the problem, though, with that is that th th those are all based on sort of uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning algorithms, sort of like a Google, uh, the Google uh, complete your sentence, complete your search, auto-complete while you're searching for something. Um, and essentially, the rationale behind that then becomes that everything is relevant. So we need everything, we need to collect everything, we need to store everything at least for a short period of time so that we can evade threats and that we can you know, go and attack folks um, because they're threatening to us. You know, because we've calculated that also. And we'll get to how that's done also. It's not really known, but just an idea about how that's done. Um, so basically, it's here that we begin to lay out an intelligence cycle that includes domestic law enforcement. Because it's not just that, because the enemy is not just a state, now it's a person, it's a terrorist. That terrorist might be here in this room. Just kidding. Um, and, 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 and then we need intelligence about that person, that cell, et cetera. So we start collecting information over here domestically, and we feed that up as well. And the collection, processing, and dissemination is not just to provide intelligence about a known threat. It's also to provide intelligence about potential threats and to harvest these sort of signatures for predicting when the next threat is going to come. So that might be, uh, let's say we know that Nick is a terrorist, right? And so we need to know his coordinates. What, what we might do is um, vacuum up a whole bunch of information and do some graphing, et cetera, and find out that he's somewhere here based on, what we, based on our algorithms and our calculations. But at the same time, we want to stop a future attack by a future terrorist that we have never met before. We've got all this data. So we run that through all these, these algorithms. And the point of these algorithms ideally would be to tell us what patterns to look for. So it's no longer our telling the machine what patterns to look for, it's the machine telling us this person might be a criminal, or this person might be a terrorist, and these are the reasons why. Um, is anyone here from Chicago? Okay, do you, do you know about the uh, biometric video cameras now they've got in Chicago? Chicago has this uh, biometric system that they'll actually um, uh, they look for suspicious movement on camera and will raise a flag for the police to come if you move erratically in one way or the other that the computer thinks is suspicious. Now, if I were to give the computer the instructions to say people that move in this way 
are criminals or are terrorists, that's one thing. But if it evaluates everything and tells me what, pe what, what folks look like when they're suspicious or about to commit a crime, that's the machine actually telling you or generating its own culpability. Lillian. Well, this is the interesting thing, right? What you would say is there's human agency. The humans are programming the machine and telling the machine what to do. But if you talk to someone who knows about artificial intelligence or machine learning, they'll tell you that what they call it is it's, it becomes opaque so that the human being can no longer describe that. So in our criminal justice system, for instance, you would have to have a police officer say, this is, what, this is how I understand there's culpability based on what I know. It's articulable, right? And this is so far removed from that that even the folks that program the machine could not tell you what algorithm was developed. And again, just to underscore, I'm talking about capabilities. So I don't have access to classified information. I'm not sitting in the NSA yesterday, whatever. But I'm telling you what is possible based on the technology that's out there and what we're developing. So based on that, that's where we take our, that's where we do our risk assessment. First thing we have to do is assess the risk and see how folks can spy on us, and then we can start to protect ourselves. Uh, machine yeah. learning is, um, hmm, it's sort of like artificial, it, it is artificial intelligence essentially, where, and, and there's different categories. One might be, um, you might program to the, you might tell the machine how to learn something. You can say, go through these uh, 19 hijackers, figure out every place they've been on the globe, figure out all of their patterns, essentially, and let's model, let's create models on that. And folks that have the same models will start to profile them. And that's actually something that happens, right? Another level of that might be, um, um, look at uh, cyber attacks. Like every time someone hacks a computer, and we can get to that in a second. Well, let's get to it right now. It, the, 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 the difference between a cyber attack and a regular terrorist attack is that the cyber attack happens so much more frequently. So to the minds of intelligence buffs, you have all this information that you can now, gen that you can now uh, churn through. Instead of just 19 hijackers, you've got millions of cyber attacks every single day in a huge industry that's built on that. So they're monitoring, they're, they're essentially collecting that and turning, turning patterns out of that. What, how can you tell that something is going to be a cyber attack, some certain um, 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 internet traffic? How can you tell it's going to result in a cyber attack? How can you distinguish that from espionage? Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, but like more, more intimately or perhaps more personal, would, would one example would be Google has um, algorithms to decide like if I'm on my computer, they start to see that I'm a certain age. I start, so when I Google things, mm -hmm. it's the algorithm is learning who I am. Mm -hmm. Is that just kind of like a way of understanding? Actually, Google, the Google search engine is the most advanced yeah. um, machine learning um, algorithm out there. And that's because there's a direct correlation by the amount of data you have and how good the machine is, how good the algorithm is. And that's very simple. And that's why when, when Keith Alexander, the head of the NSA, said collect it all, that's what he means. Because in his head, as an engineer, that's the only way you're going to generate a really powerful and accurate algorithm. Whether or not that's accurate, whether or not humans can determine human be uh, machines can determine and judge human behavior, that's a whole different story. And but that is essentially the realm that we're entering now. That's I guess what I'm trying to say. Um, and so this sort of predictive analytic, the shift between um, instead of uh, going after someone who's done something wrong, now we're trying to predict the next wrong that will occur. Um, that has started obviously at the intelligence level because as a, and that's always happened as a nation state as a nation state you, you don't want uh, an adversary to to, uh, to to bomb you or to to even uh, in terms of dip diplomatic sort of negotiations and such right and what's happening now is that there's a transition between that to actually uh, domestic law enforcement implementing the same sort of tactics and the same sort of angle and that comes from, I guess what I'm saying, essentially first to protect the nation state. That comes from national security, right? And, but it's, it's trickling down to normal crimes. It's trickling down to these machines that tell you if you move this way, that means you're a criminal. Like this is actually acceptable in society now, in a big city, in the second city, as it were. I'm only saying that because you're from Chicago. Um, so yeah, another example might be, for instance, 
um, a signature strike. So a signature strike, if you, if you look up the definition of a signature strike, it is, a, um, it, it is the identification of a target that we did not know existed before based on circumstantial evidence. So that circumstantial evidence, to the extent that it's derived from signals intelligence, is machine-generated culpability. You didn't know that uh, uh, Mary here was, a, was, was, was a, a terrorist and a threat to the United States, but somehow the machine told you, and now somebody has to push a button. Not to say that's exactly what happens, because I'm not sitting there in the NSA, but that is what the capability is. And another interesting fact is that we stopped, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, anyone, but um, I th I'm pretty sure that we stopped conducting signature strikes about two or three weeks before the Snowden revelations, or the first Snowden leak, essentially, which is right about the time that the Washington Post would have called the White House to say, hey, by the way, we've got all this crazy amount of data, and we're going to start publishing stuff. And right around then, President Obama had a speech. It was right after the Code Pink protest uh, out in, uh, I don't know where it was. But he said, you know, we're going to stop doing the signature strike, um, these types of drone strikes. Um, so as we've said, over the past 12 years or so, the dominant national security priority has been averting a terrorist attack. The new priority is cybersecurity. That's the number one priority. That's the number one national security priority. And I emphasize the word national security because it's sort of taking the place of whenever you hear terrorism, just replace that with national security and then define what national security is and what the threats are. Um, and the threats are essentially, number one, according, according to at least our official sort of position on this, number one is the cyber threat, hackers, and number two is the internal threat, which is a leaker, essentially. So if you think about it, number three is terrorism, of course. But when you're profiling for terrorism, you're looking for folks that look like me, right? And possibly, um, yeah, just me out here. Yeah. Boy, uh, you possibly also, sorry, <laughs> is what it is. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. it, it, but but when, you're, when you're trying to profile a, a cyber attack, how do you do that? How can you tell, how can you distinguish what internet traffic coming your way, whether it's just a regular person using a privacy tool to, to encrypt his data or her data and anonymize the communication, or whether it's someone that's actually trying to go in and steal some information, or whether that person is trying to uh, conduct a cyber attack that is tant tantamount to a, a uh, physical strike. And we have decided collectively as the world, essentially, a couple of years ago, that um, uh, you can hack somebody and it can rise to the level where that warrants a physical response. It warrants a, a coercive response, just as if someone had struck us with a plane or with a missile. So. We're, in, we're living in that, that era right now. And so the question is then, how do you distinguish all that? The analyst's answer to that, if I was in the intelligence community, I would tell you we need to collect more data. We need to churn more data. We need to see these patterns that human beings cannot see. Right? That's why we've got computers. That's why we're sucking up all this information here. Um, and, and we have to come out with, with actionable intelligence to tell us you know, that Nick's trying to hack the Pentagon, blah, blah, blah. And let's drone him, possibly. Who knows? Sorry, Nick. Um, and the same thing for the internal threat for leakers. Who would you think? Who do you think you would profile if you're trying to um, track down a leaker? Anyone? Mike. Who would you profile? Who you profiling? Who would you profile? The star. Well, you profile journalists. Oh yeah, of course. Because that's where the leaker's going, right? All the, all, well, the system administrators are being profiled as cyber attackers, potential war criminals, and you'll see, I mean, just wait for this, it's, it's just going to get much, much worse. And the, um, the um, journalists and other sort of speech and write the speech and expression advocates are being profiled or will be profiled for the internal threat. Lily? Would you say that the world has decided that this cyber attack okay. is safe? Is that something that's been yes. by anyone? Yes, there's uh, there's something called the Tallinn Manual. That Tallinn is a, um, the capital of Estonia. Estonia was subject to a cyber attack, I think, in 2006. And since then, there has been a big push to see. Well, they basically shut the whole country down, 
right? So everybody's sort of tripping about this. And by the way, this was the biggest priority right before September 11th, is essentially how are we going to evade asymmetric warfare from countries like China and North Korea? North Korea has like 10 IP lines. What I mean to say is North Korea has less IP lines than this room, which means that North Korea doesn't care if we cyber attack. They don't, because nothing's gonna, nothing's gonna change. NASDAQ will not crumble, right? Nobody's gonna, you know, I mean, I can't even do that on my email for 20 seconds, to be honest. I'm just checking my, I'm not reading notes right now, I'm just checking email. So what I mean to say is, it, that's, sort of, that's sort of the threat, right? That's sort of the worry. Um, and so, uh, the, the, as a matter of policy, the great states of the universe have, have basically decided that a cyber attack can reach, uh, can, can reach the level where it warrants a coercive response, which is essentially like saying, you just shot a missile at me, I'm gonna nuke your ass, right? Another little tidbit is, I mean, you can get into the conspiracy theories forever. You know, I can tell you that like the Irani cyber war deputy was shot in the heart twice, you know, shot twice in the heart like a couple months ago. Do I believe that? I don't even know. I mean, I don't believe anything these days, right? But it's stuff that's happening. It's stuff that folks are talking about. It is, if you look into, uh, for instance, the Naval War College, the courses that are offered, um, 10 years ago, they were all about terrorism. And now they're all about cyber attack. So what does that tell you? Do you know what I'm saying? Um, OK. I have a question. Yes. Um, so when you say the word cybersecurity or also cyber attack, um, how broadly is cybersecurity defined? And when you're talking about a cyber attack, that could be on, on any institution. It's not just in <coughs> let's say, um, Absolutely. like US so in terms of what the law of war would say, it's not really settled. I mean, there is this Talon manual that says in time of war, this is how we would interpret things. And that's a pretty good stand, that's a good basis. Um, however, it's up for grabs. I mean, the Obama administration a couple of years ago said, if you attack our critical infrastructure, <coughs> then you've committed an act of war, right? And the thing is, they then define critical infrastructure as everything except for like my iPad, right? So it, that essentially is overbroad, and that means that we are also committing acts of war or, or uses of force abroad and inviting a, a physical response. Do you know what I mean? So the, it, be, it becomes sort of a cyclic sort of problem in that. Um, but all to say, you're comp you should write a note about it or something because it's something that we need to hash out. So how can you distinguish between one or the other? The one cool thing that I've learned from the, uh, um, I think it was National Geographic, who did the NSA, the, the really bad NSA documentary? Was it 60 Minutes? Yeah, so 60 Minutes, they, they did this, this horrible NSA documentary that you didn't learn much from, but at some point they sort of panned the room and they, 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 one of the analysts said, you know, the definition of a catastrophe is the fact that I can't tell the difference between that and this. And he was pointing to espionage and cyber attack. So he is telling you this is the, big fucking problem. Like, I can't tell the difference. And when you can't tell the difference, now we're in the realm of, you know, the war on terror, but you're no longer fighting folks that are as disenfranchised as the folks down in Guantanamo, right? Now you're talking about worldwide war, right? Or who knows? I have no idea. Um, so it get, it's, it's, again, a very um, interesting and scary sort of world out there um, in terms of that. Um, and we could talk about all the private industry repercussions and all this stuff, but that's feels like a different uh, conversation. But you're absolutely right, Bill. That is a milestone in terms of our taking steps uh, towards escalating the, uh, the, the idea of cyber warfare, right? Because we're actually prosecuting these guys for espionage. As to what would be uh, an act of war, I'm not sure. Um, but I think the point is that these are all new notions of violence. So at least in terms of like the terrorist attack, you knew that there was going to be some sort of um, some sort of, you know, uh, physical violence. That's the idea, right? Um, but this is, of course, getting up into a completely different, um, different um, arena. But getting back to surveillance, all this to say that in the analysis of what is cyber espionage, what is a cyber attack that has it risen to the level where it warrants course of force, et cetera, there is nobody, and correct me if I'm wrong, Nick, because you're much smarter than me, um, but nobody will tell you that, it, that probably the government is not trying to get everybody's information because it is, it is, 
So uh, no, no, I, I don't mean just the conspiracy theorists. I mean as a, as a technical matter, you would want all the information if you are trying to prevent a cyber attack. In this sort of way of thinking, where you can just process everything, turn it into patterns, and then tell folks who's guilty and who's not, right? So. I guess all this to say, we're screwed in terms of, you know, unless we protect ourselves, right? And how do we protect ourselves from um, all of our data either being um, collected um, uh, or, or actually uh, read, et cetera? Uh, there are sort of three major threats that you encounter. Uh, the way I look at it, the three are the content of your communications being captured by a third party. Uh, there's the associated metadata, uh, which some uh, authorities in the national security world say is actually more enlightening to them than the actual content of the communications. And the third issue is uh, geodata, geolocation data, uh, to sort of track your physical whereabouts. Um, with GPS technology that's in your phone, uh, it's actually quite fine-grained. It can be within a couple of meters. So. Uh, supposedly close enough to be able to hit you with a, a rocket or something. Um, there are a lot of different applications that people use to, uh, to insulate themselves from these three threats. Um, we have a limited amount of time today, so from a tactical point of view, I thought to try to introduce uh, one set of tools that comes as a package. Uh, that I think would be relatively easy for people to try out on their own. Um, the uh, software I'm going to talk about today is, is called Tails, uh, and it's an operating system that you can run on a regular PC, on, on a laptop or on a desktop, and usually it runs from a little USB drive like this one, uh, which you can kind of carry around with you. This, you know, this is just a normal one, and it's the same as anyone you get in the store for five bucks or ten bucks. Uh, and what's interesting about Tails is it encompasses a whole bunch of different security techniques and comes prepackaged and pre-configured so that you don't have to sit there and sort of figure out each individual tool. Essentially, the, the, uh, the framework that, that you have to look at when you're trying to do this is like, what, what is the threat? Uh, and then what is an appropriate response to the threat? And then what are appropriate tools to deal with the threat? Uh, what Tails attempts to do for us is uh, give us something that's prepackaged, where some uh, some of the top security experts in the world have already gone through this thinking. Uh, and essentially, uh, our colleague Jacob Applebaum, who is not with us today, is is with a project called Tor. Uh, Tor is an acronym. Uh, it stands for the Onion Router. Uh, the way Tor works is. Uh, uh, it takes your data and your communications, your internet packets, and bounces them off of a series of proxies, which are randomly selected from uh, a set of about 5,000, which are all over the world. Uh, and at each hop, at each uh, step of the way, um, the data is encrypted once again. So it's encrypted once, then twice, then three times, and then exits from the uh, Tor network. Now, this accomplishes three things. Uh, it, it sort of deals with the three issues that I mentioned before. Uh, by encrypting the data multiple times, uh, the content of your communications is protected from being uh, captured and surveilled by a third party, even uh, one that's monitoring the entire network. Uh, the metadata, meaning uh, being able to tell that, for instance, uh, this whistleblower is talking to that journalist uh, is protected. Uh, and third, uh, by bouncing your signal off of these different proxies, which are typically located in three different countries, it makes it very difficult to tell where the actors, where the communicators are physically located. Uh, I'm going to plug in a laptop that I have here, uh, which is running tails, uh, just to sort of give you a quick uh, overview of it. Um, Does anyone, um, do y'all get what Dick was trying to tell you? Basically, you have to use tail, tails in order to protect your communication. Is that, is, that's really the takeaway from this. Yes, it's all built in. So yeah, so I mean, 
he's describing everything in detail for everyone's benefit, but the cool thing is that you can actually use this thing and it's all built in. That's the whole idea of it. Mm -hmm. The question I have, which is, I'm sure, you know, I use Tails, but of course, if your computer already has a bug in it, and you type the letter mm -hmm. A, it's not going to be encrypted until it goes to the Exactly. So, you're already, so the encryption. So Michael's asking a really good question, which is, if my computer's already bugged, what good is Tails going to do if they're already viewing everything every keystroke? And what Nick would probably tell you is that you should have two computers. You should have like a burner computer for your sensitive communications and a regular computer for your um, just everyday type of communications. Is that correct? One of the, so I run this small nonprofit. One, we have an advisory board. Uh, one of the people on it is, is Jacob. Uh, another one of the folks on it, and it is kind of a case of strange bedfellows, is a man named uh, Brian Snow, uh, who's a former tech director of the NSA. Uh, but he left because he was kind of upset about some of the stuff that was happening at the uh, NSA after uh, September 11th. Um, and I've had a lot of talks with him, just to, in general, just about how governments do security. And you know, one of the very basic things that people that work with classified information do is they'll have two computers on their desk. One computer is for unclassified information and one is for classified information. And you know, depending on what type of law uh, or, or practice or, or career you're in, that may end up being uh, a really good kind of a policy to copy. Uh, because why reinvent the wheel? Uh, the government spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to be secure. Uh, we can learn from that. Uh, so that is uh, definitely a strong recommendation, it, it, and this is a, a very pertinent question. You know, the the more you encrypt your data, and the stronger precautions you take against your data being surveilled while it's on the wire, uh, the weak link in the chain begins to become your device. Like, what if you know? What if your if your telephone? comes with software built in that, that listens into everything, which some of them uh, do. Uh, now, uh, it sort of goes above and beyond what I had intended to speak on today, uh, but uh, there, are, there are laptops you can use that are more secure and there are some that are less secure. And there are a whole series of steps that you can take to try to uh, remove untrusted software from your laptop and make it, I, I, I don't want to say, you know, th there is no such thing as like absolutely secure, but, but more secure. Uh, but I guess I don't want to go uh, too far down uh, the rabbit's hole and, and off on a tangent too much. Uh, essentially, uh, oh, did this come up? Oh, now it's, now it's got two screens. Plus you probably already have a tail, like an actual tail on you. <laughs> you probably already have a tail on you. Find your office. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. So, so, so maybe here's here's a really simple answer. Uh, if you, uh, Mr. Ratner, you want to get a secure laptop and run Tails on it, I would suggest the simplest thing for you to do is go to a real brick and mortar shop and buy a laptop with cash, right then and there. You're pretty much guaranteed that, that the NSA has not snuck in and put a backdoor into the laptop at that point. And if you're not running any of the software on the laptop, then you're in, you're in pretty good pretty good shape, I think. Uh, you know, if if you're not uh, gonna gonna pull out a soldering iron and start modifying the laptop and, and getting into really heavy technical stuff, this is a pretty good start, I think. Uh, and it's a, probably the most complex answer I could give in this well, in this context. <laughs> Sure. 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 Uh, I guess for the for the uh, purposes of this discussion, what Tails really does for you in this context is it prevents you it prevents your internet service provider and people who might be listening in on the uh, network itself from being able to capture your data. It doesn't necessarily make your laptop completely secure. Uh, so I guess I don't want to. Uh, give people, you know, f a false set of expectations, or uh, you know, mislead anyone in that in that context. Um, Can I, are yeah. you trying to get this this talk to that? Uh, well, it's talking. It's just it's set up with two screens right now. I have to uh, figure that out. 
I'm sorry. I'm going to field questions while we're figuring out the tech stuff. Uh, okay. Yes. I think one thing yeah. uh, would be good to add that oh. probably Jake would say right now is that security is about the computer side, but also the human side as well. We're getting to that. Okay. So That's a whole thing. That. Yes, absolutely. All right. That's, you're absolutely right. Yes. Um, so before when you're talking It's not about the IP address per se. Uh, like right now, I'm connected to uh, the university's network here, and I have an IP address on their network. It's more about the packets of communications that are going out there. So if you're sending an email, it's, it's the contents of those packets, which then leave the university's network, go somewhere across the country or around the world, and end up in someone else's email box that we're concerned with. Uh, uh, you know, we've got these great IT guys helping us here at the university, but we don't know, like, they, they could be listening in on everything, and uh, Verizon could be listening in, and then, uh, you know, Vodafone, as it was mentioned earlier, could be listening in. So it's like, uh, th there are both uh, private and state actors along the way that, that could be listening in, and, and that's essentially what Tails can help protect you from. And when you say listening in, do you mean metaphorically listening in, or, like, in the sense no. of, I mean, like, I mean, audible. That's a really good question. Versus, like, you keep saying listening, yeah. but when you're talking about emails, you're, the concept is, is that you're transferring data as true. opposed to listening. True, true, yeah. I guess so in, 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 in the context of, of email, yes. It's, uh, I guess, I guess the, the more technical term <laughs> would be like capturing the traffic and then analyzing it in some way. So whether it's reading the email or if you are having, let's say, a voice over IP, you know, Skype call or something, then they, they might actually be listening. Uh, yeah, I guess the I'm using the term say, a bit loosely. The NSA would say that collecting your information is not actually reviewing it, therefore they're not intercepting your communications, so. Um, Tails comes with a whole set of tools, one of which what we're looking at right now is just their web browser, which is uh, a hardened version of uh, Firefox, uh, but it comes with uh, some security tools built in that most people uh, wouldn't know about. It. Uh, separately, it also has uh, an instant messaging client uh, which does end-to-end -end encryption so that when you're talking to someone else, uh, only the two people at the endpoints can actually read the messages and someone who captures them in the middle won't be able to read them. Uh, third, it also includes an email client uh, which supports uh, what's called PGP or GPG, it's an, an e email encryption software. Uh, it's the most commonly used one. Um, and what's really neat about Tails is that to get, if you were to start with, let's say, your Macintosh or your PC laptop and try to get all these different programs working, uh, it would essentially take you hours. Uh, you'd be reading these like how-to documents all over the internet. And you, you, it would just be a lot of effort. And perhaps you might make a mistake along the way. Uh, what's nice about this is that all the different applications from the instant messaging client to the web browser to the email client are all configured to run over the Tor network uh, without fail, like there's no way that it will not. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a way that you can sort of skip uh, a lot of the learning curve and you can skip a lot of the time and effort required to get a configuration like this set up. Um, now. Uh, I wanted to mention that, like this is, you know, this is obviously a, a very thin kind of overview of, of this material, and it would take a lot longer to teach uh, everyone how to actually use a system like this. But uh, my organization, as as was mentioned at the beginning of this talk, uh, is doing a whole series of uh, uh, seminars uh, and workshops at our office uh, on Spring Street in Manhattan, and I would like to invite everyone to, you know, come and join. Uh, it's, it's completely free. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization. Uh, I, I dropped a bunch of stickers on the two tables uh, near the doors there uh, with our web address on it in case we didn't write it down earlier. So I have a stupid question. Yeah. Um, so what if you went on Google, what country would Google think you're in? That's a good question. Um, let's see. Oh, that's even better. Uh, it, well, it doesn't say what country. 
to say well so if you're using Tor and you get a Google page that's in like German or something that probably means it's working it's not like someone's hacked you so, by the way because you know Google thinks that you're coming in at that endpoint from that German machine or that German computer did you have a question earlier uh, yeah so I was wondering if they if they're sending your packets encrypted is it that like the NSA or whoever can't intercept them at all, or they just can't see it to intercept it? What's interesting is that the NSA will has that in, in, in their FISA minimization procedures, they have to intercept all the encrypted messages uh -huh. to store. Okay, so, so they, they have to collect them all and store them as part of their minimization, which is ironic. Uh -huh. Is that the word ironic? I think so. So, uh, but the pro but the, the the idea then is, can they crack them? So that's what this is doing. No. Oh, like it's making. I mean, it's making it making it so they're still going to collect it but now it's encrypted so they can't like see it. They, it makes it more difficult for them to do Does that. Does it make it suspicious because now they're seeing like this packet That's super encrypted? That's a really good question. Yes. Okay. I would say yes. Okay. Uh, does, does it make it so that your packets cannot be captured? Absolutely not. There's really nothing you can do about that. Especially if they're if they're capturing everything in the entire internet. Well, That's why you need to collect it all. Yeah, there's not much we can do about that. Uh, does it make it more suspicious? It, it can. The, one of the things that the guys who develop this software, and, and Tor in particular, have spent a lot of time trying to do is, uh, they, they've been working on making their <coughs> software uh, try to pass through, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of like the Great Firewall of China. Uh, you know, firewall ha uh, China has this huge firewall that blocks all internet access in and out of the country, uh, and they block access to things they find politically objectionable, uh, and, and all kinds of stuff, whatever they choose to block. Um, Iran also has an amazing real-time system where they can see all these encrypted connections going in and out of the country and in real time they will drop the connections that are Tor. Um, they can't open the connections and understand what's inside them so they just block them. Can they trace them back? They could, yeah. Uh, now one of the things that the, the people who develop this software have tried to do is to try to masquerade their connections as the most common type of encrypted connection on the internet, which would be a web browser to a Microsoft web server. So they try to make it look exactly like fingerprint-wise, like a, a very common and benign connection mm -hmm. uh, to sort of help it get through. So they, uh, it doesn't, it's, it, it's not quite necessarily a red flag, like this person's doing something wrong. Uh, but if you have a client in Iran or Syria, for instance, um, and If I had a client in Syria and I wanted to communicate with that client, one of the things I'd do is definitely give Jake a call or Nick a call and figure out whether just communicating in this way would get my client in trouble. So, and that kind of leads us to um, what my friend over here was talking Carrie. about. Huh? Carrie. Carrie? Yeah. Okay, what Carrie was talking about. He was talking about what, what, what's known as operational security or OPSEC. And, and one of the, the huge, uh, Sorry, one of the huge, one of the huge uh, components of, of maintaining private communications and secure communications is actually your operational security. So for instance, let's say Nick just installed Tails on that computer, which he bought down the street for 300 bucks or something cash, and then he goes up to his hotel room and then walks out and has a couple of drinks with his friends and then comes back up to his hotel room. That computer is compromised. Whether or not it's someone's gotten into the room, you just assume it's compromised, right? What if a maid came in and swapped the hard drives or bugged his computer or did something like that? So is, is everyone following me? So I guess what I'm saying is that it's more important to be uh, operationally secure in your actual motions and what you say, what you do, where your devices are, uh, than it is to be um, um, to encrypt and, well, to, 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 be, uh, to keep your information and communication secure, it, or as important. But the difference is operational security is is a is something that's necessary even when you're not uh, using digital communications, which is why paranoid people like me are perfect for this. <laughs> so you know, like first time I met Jake, I was toting this giant um, bag, and he's like, "What's in the bag?" I'm like, "My computer." So he's like, "That's absolutely right." So I gained his respect apparently. 
Um, I'm sorry, Nick, to interrupt. No. Uh, Got a couple of questions. Yeah. These, the alleged terrorists. No, it's actually. <laughs> um, they also have to have tails as their operating system, or they they do they don't have to. Uh, there are the equivalent programs available for Mac and Windows and Linux to do everything that Tails does. Uh -huh. It just takes a little bit more work. Uh, so if, for instance, uh, the instant messaging uh, client that comes with Tails, runs on Windows also. Uh, it's called Pigeon, uh, but not spelled like the bird, spelled like uh, Pigeon English. Uh, and, uh, you know, so you can, you, can get, uh, you can get all these different programs for different operating systems. Uh, you can also get programs for Android phones and for iPhones that do most, mostly the same stuff. So uh, a person does not have to use Tails in order to communicate securely, but it, it, it gives you, a, a, I think, a, a much better head start, I think, on, on uh, operating system security as well as uh, application level security, so uh, if, if that makes sense. Another way to kind of answer that might be um, you don't need Tails on the other side to communicate. Like, I can communicate to Nick using my, my Mac because I have the right software installed. But um, it's probably more secure if both parties have tails on computers that are throwaway computers that you keep in your, your, your pocket over here all the time and that you bought with cash. <laughs> That's really, at the end of the day, what, what you kind of have to go through. Well, let's just take the anti-fracking movement, which I'm involved in. Now, I get emails. I, I like, log, book a bus ride to a site for a rally. I'm constantly posting stuff on Facebook that's either victories or things that are going on or things that have happened. You know, I mean, I'm in communication with a lot of people. And I sort of think, well, I have copper wiring. You know, I don't have a GPS. I don't have a, a, a smartphone. You know, I know yeah. that's kind of naive. But <laughs> tell me how, practically speaking, Tails would assist. I mean, I'm already identified. We're being labeled environmental Right. We're going up against the oil and gas. Industry, right. So that's cool. Yeah, how dare you? And that's only just like one little part of what I do. So, you know, talk to me. <laughs> um, Break it down. I'm not sure what the question is. I, I mean, what would Tails do to. Well, actually, I think you, wait, wait, it sounds like what you're saying is you're using a regular phone to communicate. Yeah, I have a landline yeah. phone. I, and, I and don't have fiber optics coming into my house. <laughs> <laughs> You know, if you're not if you're not concerned with your communication being surveilled, and and it sounds like maybe you're not, well, then I've been doing stuff for a really long time. So it doesn't so matter. I'm like they they know me. I mean, I do lots of things, so you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's a million different ways to look at it. You know, there's a lot of people who say if I'm not doing anything wrong, I have nothing to hide. I don't buy into that line of thinking personally, uh, just because uh, I feel like. Uh, there are a lot of people who aren't doing anything wrong but do have something to hide in terms of, uh, like just to pick a random example, in, in something like 27 U.S. states, you can be fired for cause for being homosexual. You know, there is a perfect example. Like They're not doing anything wrong, but they have something to hide. Or, uh, you know, another example that, that people seem to relate to is like, I have curtains in my house because sometimes I walk around without clothes uh, and I don't want my neighbors to see, but that doesn't mean that I'm doing something wrong. So sometimes people just want privacy and they want to protect themselves from being surveilled. If n Now that we know uh, from the Snowden revelations about the degree of surveillance that's going on in the telecommunication system, uh, there is a certain chilling effect that it has on people's political speech. Uh, and people who tend to be more on the, on the timid side will tend to self-censor uh, when they go online. And so, you know, to me that, that actually uh, is, is a really, big problem in, in civil society if we're going to sort of make people 
feel intimidated on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so I guess what I would say to you is uh, if you were to run something like this on your computer, and, and it's actually quite usable, it's got every tool that you would commonly use. You, you'd be able to go on Facebook, you'd be able to email, you'd be able to you know, browse the web, do whatever you normally do. Uh, you would know that uh, your communication was much more anonymized. You would not be seeing targeted ads based on everything you've ever searched for uh, when you go on Google. Um, is, it, is it necessary to, to, to keep you alive? Maybe not. How much does it cost? It costs nothing. Uh, it's free software. I heard uh, you from back here. That was bad operational security. <laughs> <laughs> so you get what I'm saying? That's, that's bad operations. Do, do, do you not get what I mean? No. Okay, I just heard what he was saying. He didn't have to encrypt what he was saying. He just whispered it to Michael, but I heard it back here. That's bad operational security. He just told me something. So if he was trying to protect that information between them two, I heard it. So that's sort of, that's an example of bad operational security. Does that make sense? Yeah. So give you another, okay. We've got some more questions. Yes. Uh, I think it's helpful with these kind of conversations to take a, a long view of this as a political struggle, that it's not about surveillance per se, it's about political control and surveillance is a really good tool to create political control because people self-censor. That's why they put up like signs in the store that says you're, you're under video surveillance because people will steal less if they think that they're under surveillance, whether or not they actually are. And so in that, in that situation with attorneys and working with clients, there is a really good reason to use really high level tools because everything at this point we know from Snowden is being um, surveilled. However, um, in a situation of an activist, a lot of the questions is you want to. I mean, I'm also an attorney. I'm, sorry. I wasn't trying to. I was just the, the, the hat you had on was an activist. Right, right. So um, it is really important to to, to be as um, outrageous or out out there as possible and be as public as possible. Unless you're Muslim, please don't. <laughs> sorry. Well, it's true. I, mean, I live in a Muslim. Well, it's just don't say anything about Allah or Jihad or any of that stuff. <laughs> just kidding. I'm, I can make these jokes, right? Oh, boy. So, uh, okay. Hey, Al Jazeera <laughs> English is not my theme, okay? <laughs> Wait, right. the, so part of the question is how do we kind of expand the political space as part of this? And using tales as part of that expanding the political space when you're dealing with someone who would be otherwise very heavily targeted. But being very public about activism is also a way to do that. Um, and being really upfront about that and okay about that is, is important to help other timid people step forward. So. That, that's a really good point, and I would add that probably yeah, if, if the, the more that everybody uses encryption and anonymity tools and stuff like that, the more that it stops becoming suspect, the fact that you're using it, and the more that uh, we begin to develop it more and more, et cetera. Uh, yeah, I just have a few practical questions. You keep saying buying cash, buying cash. I'm actually thinking about buying a new computer, and I'm positive that all of my, my previous computer has probably have been to based on my past job. So my question is, do you mean buying ca cash, buy a brand new computer so there's no credit card trail and then put tails in immediately? Or is, are you saying that that's there's, Yeah, there's two reasons. Okay. Two reasons that buying in cash, well, at least two reasons that buying with a credit card might be problematic. The first is it identifies that computer to you in some way. So now it's, even if you give it to me, it's somehow attached to you, right? And the second is that Usually we, when we buy something using a credit card, we buy it online, it gets delivered, especially with Macs and whatever, and there is another type of, uh, you know, some of the Snowden revelations, have, what's come out is that uh, the NSA can, has actually stopped uh, packages in shipment and, and exchanged hardware or actually put products in systems. So when Nick says buying cash, he means cash, like... Cash, cash, no checks. Cash money. Cash money, okay. What do you think? Do you agree? That was also a joke. How come that was funny, but the Al Jazeera thing? Okay, fine. I can't believe this. This is, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was just wondering um, your, some of your thoughts on, on this particular point. So a lot of us are not working with national security, per se, these kind of like um, higher conversations. So we're working with, um, potentially working with low-income uh, communities. Um, and so. There are two things that I, I think I've kind of noticed. So there's um, implications of technology in civil matters and criminal matters. So, so civil matter and technology, my concern is web lining, right? So we're like, we've learned about this and some of the work that um, my colleague and I have been doing this summer, um, looking at, you know, for instance, this is one uh, I can think of. So algorithms can determine um, if you're a young person and you're on a 
um, I think if you're on Microsoft, you're more likely to get um, private loans offered through the little uh, bars, right? And that makes sense because if you have a Mac, you know, the, the algorithm is determining that you're wealthier. Oh. So there, there's, these are implications that are happening with low income folks. And in the criminal, um, as I said, I'm from Chicago, and one of the things that I don't know if it's really talked about, but low income um, folks that use like prepaid um, phones and, and those kind of things are more likely to be hacked by the police. Like it's just a common practice. Um, you know, some of my friends who are in, who have these phones, when I was younger, they would say, oh, that, sometimes you get that fuzzy noise. And it's because the, the, the police are, are, are like listening. And so they do it with gang members and things like that. So so what are the kind, and this is great, you know, and this is like if, if you are working with international issues, um, but what kind of other technology can we give to youth who, uh, youth of color over index on technology? Um, that's kind of like the hard data that we know. So what kind of practical tools can we give? like? Um, in regards to criminal and civil matters that may emerge in, in a preemptive context. Uh, and one of the platforms that we're discussing is Android phones, which are very common smartphones, as you know. Uh, and there are really great free tools for encrypting your telephone calls, your voice conversations, for encrypting your text messages and instant messages, uh, for encrypting the contents of the phone in case you should lose it or it should fall into the hands of a third party. Uh, and I think that, uh, from what I understand, I mean, I'm, I'm getting uh, a bit on in, in years, but I understand that the kids are all about the mobile devices now, right? Like, I don't know if they even use laptops. I don't know. Uh, I have a child, but she's only four, so uh, I'm just out of touch with what kid, kids do. But. But, but also to add to that, I mean, all, all this stuff trickles down anyway. So the, it, I, I understand that it, it seems very high level, but this is all stuff that in two years everyone will be using. I mean. Whatever I'm using right now, that technology will be used by the kids that you're talking about in two or three years anyway. So I don't think that this is something to avoid teaching anybody ever. Just just as a, as a thing. Lily. So if somebody's using this system and they get arrested for whatever, and there's a warrant to search their computer, their, I mean, is there a way for them What was the last part of the question, please? I'm just, I don't know. Can, can, can the oh, cops saying, that, are, that oh, take your can, computer. Can they, get, can they get the data? Yeah. Uh, one of the other <laughs> features of Tails, which I didn't even mention, I guess, uh, now that now that you remind me, is that uh, it encrypts all the data that's on stored your, that's stored on the, on the little thumb drive. Okay. Uh, so number one, you can take it with you. You can just put it in your pocket and take it with you. Uh, and even if it, even if you should lose it or if it gets seized by an authority, uh, they won't be able to open it without knowing the password. Can they demand towards to decrypt it? Can they demand? I don't know whoever. Oh, is there a back no, door no, 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 no. There's no back doors. They can, they can demand that you give them the password. There, you know, there's something that we, like in my business, we kind of refer to as like the rubber hose scenario. Uh, you know, we're like, you know, they're, they're so threatening, you, threatening you, you or trying to hurt you somehow mm -hmm. to, to get your password. Whether you give it or don't is sort of like up to okay, you. Okay, so it's only if you give your password. In uh, yeah, uh, basically you have to put faith in, in math that that the cryptography really does work. And uh, if Edward Snowden's any indication, it seems to be working. <laughs> Yeah, uh, absolutely. There, there have been talks of trying to bring encryption technology under government control. Going back as far as uh, the early to mid 90s, there was a whole discussion where uh, the government wanted people to uh, build into the encryption algorithms uh, uh, essentially a feature where you would uh, give a key to the government to be held in escrow so that they would be able to unlock everything. Uh, and a lot of people went nuts over it and, and fought it, and, and, and it never did pass. Uh, there are also um, some countries in the world where, where you're not allowed to use these type of tools. Uh, thankfully, this isn't one of them. Uh, uh, I, I don't know if I've ever been to a country myself where you can't use these tools, but uh, it's probably a good idea to check 
uh, before you travel. Uh, uh, some of the technology that, you know, my, my organization does a lot of education, but we also build a lot of software tools uh, for people to use. And, and some of the stuff we, we've been uh, having people at uh, Harvard uh, Berkman uh, Center do some legal research on the legality of using the stuff that we're building in other countries. And it turns out that some of it is not uh, allowed to be used in, in certain places. Like I know uh, India was one country that came up. Uh, where some of the stuff we've written is illegal in India, uh, but it's OK here. So uh, yeah, there, there, there have been efforts to try to uh, control and ban the use of cryptography. Uh, thankfully, it, it, it's sort of like an internationally developed uh, software. And the, uh, the know-how is out there, and it's sort of like you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's been uh, spread for, you know, 20 years, and it's I actually, think it would, be, it would be very challenging to get rid of it, I, I would think, at, at this some point. point uh, certain types of encryption, encryption were listed as uh, munitions, as in, as in weapons. Mm -hmm. Munitions, yes. Mu like, you, like you're trading in arms now, that kind of thing. And that's sort of the era that Nick was referring to. It's known as the crypto wars, basically. And one of the biggest uh, incentives for us to, for the United States to basically uh, stop that practice was that um, it was going to stifle trade. E-commerce, like that all functions on some form of encryption. Like you're, you give your credit card number to somebody and it's protected. And so when we realized that it was going to, we were going to take an economic hit, it, we decided it was okay. Basically, so it's very political. Nowadays, the other types of technology are, are there is uh, a lot of talk about uh, certain stuff like uh, like uh, vulnerability exploits on s security exploits, uh, what are called ODE ex exploits, um, being weaponized and uh, regulating them. So um, that's a whole other thing that we can talk about. But but essentially, um, yet short of it is yes, technology is being criminalized, um, and that goes on to kind of like a continuation from what I was talking about earlier. Um, the way that it's viewed from our military perspective is that it's asymmetric warfare. Do you get what I mean? There, there's sort of like a weird, uh, almost like a schizophrenic uh, thing around <coughs> within, within the US government in particular where some, you know, I, I, got, I got involved in a struggle against the government in terms of uh, civil litigation and, and a constitutional challenge. And I guess when I started it, I was younger, and I had a, a much more monolithic view of the government. Like, well, the government's doing this. And as time went on, I started to realize that, that having a, a monolithic view of the government, that, that my view of it was uh, overly simplistic. And right now, uh, parts of the government want total insight into all communications for whatever reason because they're I don't know they're, they're afraid of the boogeyman or they uh, just want to control everything or they just want to know everything who knows you know then but there are other parts of the government that are actually funding research and development of all this encryption software uh, particularly the State Department uh, USAID uh, and some of the DARPA. The, uh, DARPA. DARPA yes less so most of it's actually coming from from the uh, from the foreign, uh, the foreign part of the foreign relations uh, part of the government, uh, and it's 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 a highly ironic thing where it's sort of like the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing, and, and they're they're actually uh, creating things that are that are clashing with each other. Uh, and then I guess another thing that blew my mind was just that even within one organization like the NSA, you know, half of them are about making things more secure and encrypting things and developing ways to encrypt things in such a way that, let's say, China can't open them. The other half is trying to open everything and listen to everything. So there are, there are these all these different competing forces. Uh, <clears throat> so yeah, there definitely are, I think, like people that in, in, in Congress and in the legislature who have like this knee-jerk reaction that they, they see a story on the news uh, these guys were communicating with encryption and they're like, oh, this is bad, we have to ban this, and that, that happens. Uh, but there, are, I think, are a lot of forces within the government that understand and believe that having strong encryption be available to people in the world is uh, good for democracy, good for free speech, uh, and good for uh, revolutionary movements, and, uh, uh, and good for freedom of expression. Uh, and so I, I don't feel like that 
uh, that it's going to be completely banned anytime soon. I guess I just wanted to sort of like talk about some of those weird interplay things going on. I mean, my organization, like I, a lot of people think of me as someone that fought the government because I, I did for like 10 years. But the biggest grant that my nonprofit has is indirectly from the State Department uh, to develop documentation for people in the third world to use this type of technology to be able to do whatever they want. Uh, I'm not concerned with what it is, just that they be able to do it. Just you to use it domestically, or, or to communicate with the person there? I don't think that anything entails is illegal in India. I was actually thinking of some some completely other thing. Um, what does that be illegal? Just where someone else is not using it and does not have access to it, or whatever. I know it's free, et cetera, but I'm just saying, like, or they just have installed it. Yeah, I mean, you can get some of the equivalent programs. In most people, most people in the world have a have a computer running Windows. So if you're going to do instant messaging with them, then you tell them to get this program Pigeon. And you, if you're running Tails, you will have Pigeon on your computer. I, th I think her question is whether it's an advantage to use Tails. Like if you were using Tails here right now, yes. and I'm sitting in my house yes. using Windows yes. normal, and you just turned off your encryption, and we were chatting, right? Yes. Is, it, is there any benefit to you uh, using Tails for that purpose? Um, when you're not. Yeah, uh, first if, of all, if you're not encrypting your yeah. end to end communications? No, I just mean if one person is encrypting their communications that are going out, the other person, however, whatever direction they're communicating is not. Uh, yeah, I think there's still some advantage to that in terms of that someone who would, who would be surveilling that, that communication may not be able to figure out who's talking to who. It's like they'll, they'll know person X is talking to question mark. So maybe that there is some advantage to it. There's always a value add. Plus, at the end of the day, you're encrypting your data. And there's another, isn't there a feature where you can actually wipe it every time you turn it off? It, that's, that's by default, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, it, there, it, yes, there are advantages to, to using it for secure communications. Specifically, if, you, if the per person you're communicating with is questionable. So <laughs> I, a lot, I, I represent a lot of, or I work on a lot of uh, the, uh, national security cases that are counterterrorism prosecutions. And let's say I was investigating a case, we were talking to somebody in Somalia, and government might think they're a bad person. They might not think they're a bad person. I wouldn't, or um, I don't want that in, to be on the radar in the first place for a variety of reasons, right? So like, it's good to just protect yourself. Going in terms of preventing the worst case scenarios that we were all thinking when you're giving this presentation, 
where just where where you're seeing hope right now from legal Oh man, you're asking the wrong person. <laughs> anyone? Yeah, the last the the, the, last, the early panel was an optimistic one. This one's pretty depressing actually, but um <laughs> What do you do in your clinic? That's the why would somebody come to well, uh, they're usually uh, de criminal defendants. So if somebody's basically in trouble, it has to do with hacking, cybersecurity, or counterterrorism stuff, and I jump in to provide expertise with either technical stuff or um, uh, oftentimes it's just surveillance litigation because for the past three years, it just turned out litigating FISA warrants or just this kind of stuff, right? But. Um, no, absolutely, I'm not optimistic in any way. Like, no way, no, I mean, this is way above everybody's head. And, like, I know it's sort of a watermark, but we haven't even talked about this, like, executive authority stuff, which the government purports to protect our information with executive authority. So whether or not we win any litigation, to me, doesn't make any difference. I mean, we're talking about the use of state power against the world, it's state power. Not like, you know, state in terms of the police. That's not state. I'm talking about the state, right? Not only against other nation states, but internally. And in a way that um, they're interpreting stuff way over your head, in my head. So they're like, oh, if a human doesn't look at it, it's not collected. Okay. I mean, that's bullshit, right? But um, it's how it's interpreted. So how are you going to, like, penetrate that? Even if we penetrate this, I mean, even if we penetrate this FISA universe, this whole all the Snowden documents and we do, and we litigate everything successfully, which we're not because the, quite frankly, the doctrine isn't there in the first place, in my opinion. Um, it'll just, in my opinion, just move to the executive authority and then we'll need another Edward Snowden. I don't know. I mean, it's really these uh, whistleblowers and uh, leakers that are really, um, in my eyes, uh, the only um, bastion of hope and the cyber generation. To be honest, I mean, I'm a pretty jaded person, but like when you meet all these like hackers, it's back to being asymmetric with a lot of cool people with great politics. So maybe that's some hope. I don't know. I totally agree with that. I mean, I I, I spent great. ten years up to here, you know, involved with this litigation, and I guess the way I look at it is you could you can litigate and you can work on the legislative front, or you can come up with technical solutions. And after machines, <laughs> perhaps. Uh, you could you could go yeah that that that's it that's actually a valid thing yeah I mean go back to the way they were doing it in the old Soviet days just mimeograph uh, papers and hand them out that 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 would work I thought that was where you're going with your original question talking about like the level of technology you had I thought you were saying well I've gotten rid of everything and is that safe that that Soviet I, Union try the seventies here yeah sure I, I, I remember the seventies I no I remember it. Uh, uh, are you guys optimistic I mean. Absolutely. The, okay, fantastic. Why? Why? Because yes. people are getting together and exposing stuff, and they're okay. still out there organizing, and it's growing, and it's, you, what choice do we have? But it's not litigation. That's exactly, so I agree. So I, I'm not optimistic yeah, about litigation. No, I, I'm optimistic you know, about people. Lawyers are and not in absolutely. the forefront. I'm sorry. Absolutely. No, we can only support so, folks you know, when they get got, and that's why I do criminal defense. I, I'm not ready to give up on litigation <laughs> yet. That's, sorry. That's I'm not saying give it up, just when you were dealing with the security letters. I'm sorry, what was that? Valerie Caproni? Yes, yes, yes. A federal judge. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, <laughs> she's, no, I, I've, just, I mean, it's she's a, sort of like, I, I've heard someone told me that, they, that someone wanted to introduce me to her and they were like, you would really like her. She's really cool. And I was like, okay. Like, I'm, I'm really open-minded enough at this point that I would do it. I, I don't know that much about her. I always wondered when she gave a quote in the New York Times one time in some article where I was interviewed and she said, you know, the, the corporations that are handing over this data uh, to the government without warrants consider this to be good corporate citizenship. And when she said this, it just blew my mind. Like, does she, and I started to wonder, does she really believe this or is she just like uh, a team player and, and is she just sort of saying what she needs to say? Because I imagine if I was in that job, either I'd quit or I would actually do what was required of me. And I, I don't know, it seems so off the wall that she could believe that, but. Maybe she, maybe she is cool. I don't know. That's interesting. Where where? Do you know where? Here, SCNY. Oh, great. So maybe I'll run into her. Someday. Hopefully <laughs> never. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I'm sorry. Never mind. So that would be a bad situation. Get that's a lawyer for criminal defense. Sure, sure. Anything else? <laughs>
I mean, I think there's reason to be optimistic in the legislative realm in other countries, Brazil and Germany, for example. I think the Snowden revelations have caused them to take um, a different stance on privacy and security that is that has real ramifications internationally. Uh, encryption in Brazil um, went up 10 times in the last like six months. The use of encryption is a common thing, so if that becomes a generalized practice, it would be very difficult for any security agency to shut that down entirely, especially in a country as large as Brazil with as much political clout. Um, so I think that there are, in other countries, reasons for legislative optimism. The UN... Um, I'm not a privacy buff, by the way. I have to just say that. I, I, I always tell the feds when I talk to them, I don't care if you put a video camera in my shower, just don't interpret it to mean that I'm a terrorist. I, I think they're incompetent at analysis. And that's the, and so when you say more people will start encrypting, you know, to be a pessimist about it, okay, then that'll just raise more suspicion around other shit. I mean, it's just, it's just a very a weird kind of... Uh, I should probably go now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I don't think surveillance is going to go away. But some people have theorized that if you can encrypt a certain percentage of the internet's traffic, that it would essentially uh, undermine and make uh, impossible dragnet surveillance. Now, the thing that I was fighting against with my NSL case was dragnet surveillance, warrantless surveillance. To the extent that you push back on the government enough that they have to start targeting individuals by attacking their devices by putting a backdoor on their phone. To me, that, that's actually a step forward. Uh, that's sort of pushing it back to how it was in the old days where they had to get a warrant. Uh, so yeah, I don't think, are, are we gonna get to a utopian uh, reality where there's no surveillance? No, I don't think so. Probably not. Uh, it's always gonna be a cat and mouse game because every time someone develops a kind of encryption, someone else figures out how to break it and then you have to improve it and then they figure out how to break that. And that's never gonna end. Uh, but what, what uh, what I do find really exciting is, is uh, number one, reading Pew polling, uh, saying that all these people care about this now, that they want to do something about it, that more and more people are encrypting their uh, internet traffic, they're, they're actually trying to do this stuff, and if you uh, take a couple of steps to use something like Tails or, uh, or make sure that when you go on Google or Facebook that you're always using HTTPS, uh, the more you can encrypt the internet traffic, the more that's going to uh, undercut, uh, you know, suspicionless, uh, warrantless wiretapping. Uh, so I, I, I find that to be encouraging. I mean, will we win? I, I, you know, I don't know, but I like the idea that people want to and are willing to do something about it. Okay, fantastic. Looks like we've tired everybody out. 